So um, the next um, section, the last part of the module basically, is developmental and learning risk factors. Um, so today I'll make a start on attachment, and then we'll go on to talk about the influence of parenting, um, peer rejection, and learning from your environment. So, you know, this perspective really requires us to look back at the individual's upbringing, their social and emotional development. Um, so why study this? Well, because what we find quite often is that positive experiences during this stage of life predicts later positive outcomes and some negative experiences during this stage of life predicts some negative outcomes later. Um, when I say social development, I'm really talking about the development of social skills and picking up on social cues. And when I talk about emotional development, I'm really talking about the emergence of temperaments um, that I'll go on to talk more about. So attachment, I'm sure, is something that you've heard of before, right? It's referring to a strong, long-lasting emotional bond, okay, between two individuals. Um, it's a bond that's person-specific, okay, because all people were, you know, unique, and so the bond that forms between them will be unique. And it's something that's um, enduring across time. Now, when we're talking about attachments in early childhood experiences you know what we're talking about is attachment figures right usually it's the, the primary caregiver that we're talking about most predominantly the early literature always characterized the primary caregiver as the mother yes that's still more often than not the case but it doesn't have to be the case right the primary caregiver could be the father or a grandparent or some other attachment figure now if one has a positive close attachment, what that means is that the child identifies that caregiver, that figure as a secure base, okay? Or as a safe haven, right? Someone that they can turn to if things go bad, right? So if you think about, you know, a young child, maybe they fall over, they hurt themselves. What's the first thing they do, right? They begin to cry so that the caregiver comes to them or they go to the caregiver, right, to be comforted. So the secure base is someone who they know that they can turn to if things get rough, right? If things go bad. And this allows them to have a more enriched learning experience, right? Because they can go into the world with more confidence, more confidence to explore, because they know that if things go bad, that there's someone that they can turn to, someone who has their back. Now, in contemporary psychology, when we say attachment theory, we're talking about the ethological theory of attachment um, initially developed by John Bowlby. But there were perspectives before this, okay? The psychoanalytic perspective, so with Freud and his close followers, was the infants have a biological desire to become attached to that which provides them with pleasure, okay? It's not really explaining why the caregiver becomes attached to the infant, only really why the infant becomes attached to the caregiver. And it's also assuming that the caregiver has to positively reinforce their closeness, okay, through feeding them really is what Freud's talking about when he talks about receiving pleasure. Learning theory is also following this similar idea of positive reinforcement, okay? So the learning theory perspective is that attachment is basically a product of classical conditioning, okay? This person is feeding you, okay? They're fulfilling your needs. Therefore, you begin to have a positive um, ideas of this person. You, you're forming a positive association with this person because you're associating them with your needs being met, okay? And attachment then is just the product of this association, okay? There's a number of issues that we'll talk about with these two perspectives that the ethological theory addresses. As we're going to talk about, meeting physical needs isn't enough for attachment to form, okay? Children have needs beyond physical needs, okay? Emotional needs and so on, okay? And as we look at animal studies, what we'll find is that actually, um, when we talk about Harlow's studies, for example, um, when infants, so, Really, this is animal studies. We're talking about 
um, baby rays, monkeys, or young young mice. Um, if they're given the choice between that which has physically fed them and that which has given them emotional comforts, when they're afraid, they'll turn to that which has given them emotional needs rather than that which has fulfilled their physical needs. Okay, so that's really the main issue with both of these um, earlier perspectives. Okay, that they're focusing too much on physical needs being met, equaling then attachment. And then the cognitive perspective that you know one goes through various stages of cognitive development, increasing their cognitive co co complexity. And attachment really is in line with this. Okay, that they get to a certain level when they form attachments. Okay, because that's the stage of cognitive development that they're at. So really, what we're talking about when we talk about attachment theory today is this ethological theory that there is an evolutionary reason for why we form attachments. That it's aided in our survival as a species. Okay. So that you know. Infants come predisposed to have behaviors that the caregiver will respond to with love. Okay. And when afraid, the infant will cry, for example, because it brings the caregiver into close proximity, which will increase the chances of the infant surviving. And I'll, I'll unpack that a bit more. But let me just first talk about how the ethological theory originated. Okay. Because it was John Bowlby who developed the theory, who was a psychoanalyst in England in the 1920s. And for the most part, he was very loyal to Freud's ideas, OK? But he really wasn't happy with Freud's idea on the basics of attachment for, um, formation. But he didn't have a theory of his own until he came upon this work by Conrad Lorenz, who was doing work on what he called imprinting with baby goslings. So in this study, Conrad Lorenz had baby gosling eggs. Half of the eggs hatched in their natural environments. And the first thing that they saw was their biological mother. The other half of the eggs hatched inside the lab. And the first thing that they saw was Conrad Lorenz. And what he found was that the baby goslings would imprint themselves on the first figure that they saw. So that those who were born in their natural environment, they would imprint themselves on the biological mother, follow the mother around the lake, those born in the lab would imprint themselves on Conrad Lorenz and they would follow him around the lake as if he was their mother. Okay. This was irreversible. Those hatched in the in the lab couldn't be taught to bond with the mother or to imprint themselves on the mother. And those born in the natural environment couldn't be taught to imprint themselves on Conrad Lorenz. Okay. Moreover, he did a number of different experiments, one of which showed that the initial figure didn't even have to actually be living. Okay, in one study, the baby goslings hatched. The first thing they saw was a cardboard box, and then the cardboard box was pulled around the lake um, on a piece of string by a boat, and they would follow the cardboard box as if that was um, their mother. Um, so when John Bowlby came upon this work, he got the idea that maybe when trying to understand how people form attachments, we should also look at their everyday um, environments, okay, their natural habitats. Because, you know, the psych psychoanalytic theories were based upon case studies from Freud's patients, Freud's sessions with his patients. The learning theory ideas were based upon animal studies, mainly with pigeons and, and rats. So John Bowlby really wanted to then actually study people in their natural environments, maybe then understand how people form attachments. Obviously, people are more, you know, psychologically complicated, right, the baby goslings, okay, so it's not going to be exactly the same, but the idea here is that maybe there's some similar principles at play. So John Bowlby really wanted to integrate what he knew as a psychoanalyst with what he had learned about evolutionary theory, okay. Um, so attachment is primarily an evolutionary adaptation, right, you know, if you, maybe not here, but you know, when I was back in Scotland, I would take a lot of hikes and, you know, farm fields and so on. And if there's baby lambs, what's the first thing they do? They run to their mother, right? Because you're a sense of threat. And so it's triggering this um, attachment dynamic, okay? It's bringing them into close proximity, right? And the same with human infants. 
you know, when they feel threatened, when they're distressed, when they have some needs that needs to be met, you know, maybe um, feeling hungry or whatever, you know, they cry, right, to vocalize this distress. And again, it, it brings the caregiver into close proximity, right? Therefore, increasing the chances that the infant is going to survive, right? That these needs are going to be met or that whatever the threat is will be dealt with, right? Because they have now the security of the caregiver. Now, there's two main assumptions to John Bowlby's idea. First of all, that if you have a caregiver who's consistent, responsive, dependent, then this creates a secure base, right? Like I was talking about before, a secure base is identified, someone who you know you can count on. But unfortunately, some parents are not dependable. Some parents are not responsive to their children's needs. Some parents are not consistent. If this is the case, a secure base is not formed and an insecure attachment is formed instead, okay? I'll talk more about the differences between secure and insecure attachment, but that's just the basic assumption. The second basic assumption is that these early relationships that we have serve as working models going forward in terms of how our relationships should operate, okay? In terms of whether we expect our needs to be met, whether we expect to feel good about ourselves in relationships, or whether we're paranoid that, you know, we're going to be abandoned, that this person isn't going to be consistent with our needs. Um, so whatever these dynamics are of these early relationships, right, they serve as working models for future relationships. Now, it doesn't have to be the case that you only form an attachment with one individual. In fact, people form multiple attachments. Um, this is an early study from Scotland in which it was found that babies with more than one attachment figure increased from 29% um, at around seven months to 87% at 18 months, okay? So as the children are getting older, they're forming more and more attachments, okay? So this could be initially maybe just with the mother, but then also with the father, then with maybe grandparents and other, you know, figures in their life who are recurringly there. In about two thirds of the cases, yes, the strongest attachment relationship was with the mother, but in the other third, it was someone else, the father or some other relative or attachment figure. Now, another core, part of John Bowlby's theory is this idea of maternal deprivation. There's a quote here by John Bowlby that says, mother-infant love in infancy and childhood is more important for mental health as are vitamins and proteins for physical health. So the idea here is that being deprived contact with the mother during the early stages of development can have real consequences for one's mental health going forward. He talks about a critical period, which is the first two years after being born, okay? So if I ever mention a critical period, I'm referring to this first two years of life, okay? So if one experiences maternal deprivation during these first two years, you know, prolonged separation from the mother, it can have real consequences on their social development. There were especially two main effects on their development theorized by John Bowlby. An impact on their cognitive or intellectual development. Indeed, there's a number of studies showing um, that there is some relationship between prolonged separation during this time and then impaired intellectual abilities. Most of this is coming from Eastern European orphanage studies that show that those who stay in institutions for longer and so who are adopted after the critical period, for example, and so haven't been able to form a close relationship during the first two years, they're on average more likely to grow up having a lower IQ than those who are adopted quicker and then can form a close attachment during this critical period. And then also an impact on your emotional development. John Bowlby really theorized that maternal deprivation or prolonged separation gives rise to affectionless psychopathy, which he characterized as 
an inability to experience guilt or shame or empathy. One pretty well-known study he has um, investigating this is the 44 Thieves study, in which there's 44 criminal teenagers. They've all been accused of stealing, and they are interviewed for signs of affectionalist psychopathy. So this would be, you know, do they have any sense of empathy for the, per the person they stole from? Do they have any sense of guilt or shame over what they did? If the answer to both of those questions is no, then that would be signs of affectionalist psychopathy, according to John Bowlby. There's then a control group of non-criminals who have been found to be emotionally disturbed to see if they experienced maternal deprivation, prolonged separation during the critical period, more or less so in comparison to the thieves, okay? So the findings were that 14 out of the 44 thieves could be described as affectionless psychopaths. Out of these 14, 12 of them had indeed experienced prolonged separation during the first two years, okay? So mainly this was removed from the home by a social worker because of a bad environment, okay? And then experienced prolonged separation during the first two years. In contrast, out of the 30 thieves remaining, the non-psychopathic thieves, only five of them had experienced this prolonged separation. And out of the control group, only two out of the 44 had experienced this prolonged separation. So John Bowlby's conclusion was that yes, prolonged separation does give rise to effectualist psychopathy. Now, the main issue with this study is that it's very vulnerable to research researcher bias, right? John Bowlby is the one conducting these interviews, determining what constitutes affectionless psychopathy and also determining what constitutes prolonged separation, which might come with some leeway. And so it would be quite easy for him to interpret things in a way that would be in line with his hypotheses, okay? But as we'll come back to, there have been more recently some studies finding a correlation between neglect and the early stages of life, prolonged separation during these first two years, and an increased chance of psychopathic behavior later in adulthood. Now, very closely tied to this body of work is the work by Harry, Harry Harlow. And Harry Harlow wanted really to understand scientifically love, which hadn't really been scientifically tested before, primarily because it doesn't lend itself easily to scientific testing. But also the word of wisdom at the time was that you should be authoritarian in your parenting style. You should be very harsh and instill resilience in children. And as we'll see, Harry Harlow's work and the development of attachment theory really changed this, okay? Bringing attention to the fact that, you know, children need a secure base in order to have emotional developments that's most successful. So in Harry Harlow's work, he had um, baby rays monkeys. Um, and in one study, there's two monk there's two mothers, okay? There's a cloth mother who is, you know, comforting to the touch, um, you know, um, is going to give what he calls contact comfort, okay? Um, and then there's a wire mother who's, you know, not very comfortable to touch, but has a feeder attached to it. So it's giving the baby race monkey its milk and its nutrients. And what Harry Harlow found was that if he terrifies the baby race monkeys, and you can look up videos um, of this online, you know, he had a contraption that was a kind of robot with these kind of um, metallic teeth that would grow really, really fast. And it looks like it's running towards the baby race monkey. It looks pretty terrifying from the baby race monkey's perspective. And what he found was that the baby race monkey would run to the cloth mother, not the wire mother. Okay. So this contact comfort, this was what was crucial for the formation of attachments. Okay. It didn't matter that this wasn't what was given the baby race monkey its nutrients, okay? 
it wasn't the physical needs being met that was important. Okay, it was the fact that it was comforting um, to touch. Now, Harry Harlow's experiments have become infamous for their cruelty. Okay, he wanted to know what psychologically disturbed monkeys would be like as parents. So in one study, he had what's been called a well of despair. The baby raised monkeys were kept here for one year after they were born. They were left there alone uh, with no stimulation. And the, the result was that they were severely psychologically disturbed. Okay, They were completely unable to interact with other monkeys. They wouldn't mate. You might think that's something that's you know innate, but they just didn't have the skills to approach other monkeys to um, communicate, and they wouldn't mate on their own. All attempts to rehabilitate these monkeys failed, but still Harry Harlow wanted to know what these monkeys would be like as mothers, and so since they wouldn't mate on their own, he created what's been called a rape rack, which is just as horrific as it sounds. These psychologically disturbed monkeys were tied up and then male monkeys on heat were let off into the same cage. So they were, you know, restrained and forcibly impregnated. Um, and the result was that these monkeys could not act as mothers, okay? They didn't have the, the skills or whatever you want to call it, the capabilities of giving any sort of comfort um, to the baby monkeys. In fact, in many cases, they were very physically abusive, and in some cases would even kill um, their own offspring. <clears throat> now, this idea of contact comfort is something that then became quite well studied um, and has had a number of important implications, okay? Um, for example, Premature infants, if they're given contact, comfort, i.e. massaged, they're more likely to survive. They're more likely to have weight gain. They're less likely to have stress behaviors. Um, this contact comfort, as, we are, as we've more recently learned, is crucial for the um, stimulation, the development of a number of growth hormones and for the development of the immune system. Um, it's true in a number of species. Baby rats, for example, you can keep in cages and you can feed them and make sure all of their physical needs are met, but are unlikely to survive if they don't have some sort of contact comfort. Okay? And even stroking them with the eraser side of a pencil is enough um, contact comfort okay, to, have, um, to have this contact that they need okay, for the stimulation of the um, growth hormones to develop and the immune system to develop. Um, there's one meta-analysis looking at contact comfort in premature infants. This is just one study result showing you what I'm talking about. You know, we have a group of premature infants who are given contact comfort, who are massaged, and then a control group who are not massaged. At the start of the experiment, we look at their stress behaviors. And then at the end of the experiment, we see that the massaged group has a significant decrease in their stress behaviors, whereas the control group, their stress behaviors has only increased. Another body of work that's really tied to what I'm talking about is work done in Romania um, on the orphanages there. Um, the circumstances were pretty extreme, okay? In the 1980s, there was a dictator in Romania who believed that the way to better the economy would be to massively increase the population, okay? So contraception was made illegal. Abortion, under any circumstances, was made illegal. Women were told, you have to have this many children by this age, otherwise there'll be financial penalties. Um, and the result of this was that families were having so many, so much children, they couldn't care for them. There wasn't the food, there wasn't the resources to care for them. Babies were being abandoned on the streets. They were being left on the doorsteps of orphanages. 
And in 1989, there was 100,000 orphans spread across 600 orphanages run by the state. These orphanages were so overpopulated that there wasn't the resources to feed them, so they were severely malnourished. There, there wasn't the staff to give them regular contacts, to give them stimulation. So a number of them were left alone for days at a time in their cribs. And they're having no regular one-on-one -on -one contact with any staff member, okay? And there's been a number of research studies um, looking at what the consequences of this sort of development was, okay? Um, Rutter and colleagues are some of the researchers done done a lot of the studies. Um, in one study of theirs, there's 165 Romanian orphans, and they're compared to um, those in different groups, depending upon when they were adopted. So they're all adopted by British families, some before six months, some before two years, so it's still within that critical period, and some after the critical period. And then they're assessed at four, six, and 11 for their cognitive, physical, and social development. And then compared to a control group of um, 52 British adoptees adopted at the same time. If they were adopted within six months, there was no impact on their cognitive development at any stage going forward. If they were adopted after this, there was a, um, a significant impact negatively on their IQ and cognitive development. Um, if they were adopted after six months, they also showed signs of disinhibited attachment. So very clingy, attention-seeking behavior. Not too surprising, right? Because these were individuals in the care setting fighting for attention, right? There was so many infants to care for, right? That if they wanted the attention, right, they really had to cry out for it. Um, at age 11, there was emotional and conduct disturbance in all of the Romanian adoptees, um, signs of ADHD, inattention, hyperactivity, and higher rates of autistic-like patterns also in the Romanian adoptees. Um, I don't have time right now, but I have a video, a small documentary, it's about 10 minutes, um, that kind of gives an example of actual um, real cases, okay, from the Ro Romanian orphanages that I'm talking about. Um, but I'll wait until next time to share that with you. Um, before I finish up, is there any final questions? Okay, if there is, you can come up and ask. Okay, otherwise, thanks, everyone. I'll see you next time.